Hello, everybody. Today is September 28th, and I'm reading from 1 John chapter 2. And John describes several characteristics about the aspects of love and uh, living victoriously over sin. He introduces us here in this chapter the prescription for sin. That is the sin problem that is uh, a human uh, challenge. And you and I are born in this world with sin. We come to Christ. We're forgiven of sin. And, and yet there is a struggle here of, uh, of who's going to rule in your life and my life. It's, and this is key, what he talks about. In verse 1, he says, my little children, I write to you so that you may not sin. So here's something. There are some people who would suggest to you that you and I cannot live above the power of sin. And yet John has been given to us a prescription here and saying to you, listen, I'm writing this so that you're going to have victory over sin, so that, that it will not rule in your life any longer. But yet at the same time, though he says, I'm writing this so that you do not sin, he does not suggest here that you are incapable of sinning or that you'll ever come to the place of which that won't be a challenge. He gives them a prescription if anyone sins uh, that we have an advocate with the Father. We have a mediator. We have someone who will stands as the bridge between us and names him Jesus Christ, the righteous one, and, uh, and that he himself is the propitiation for our sins. That is, he paid the penalty. He's he is, Christ is the one of which we have the remedy for the issue of sins. Not only for our sins, as the Bible say, but for the whole world. Now, the whole world has opportunity for this prescription for sin. It's not an absolute, that is that it's, uh, we're not believing in universalism, that everybody's going to be saved uh, or that everybody's sins are forgiven. No, they have to receive the gift by faith. And then it is, ad, it is uh, uh, activated in their heart. And then he talks about obedience and how this plays into the life of the Christian. In chapter, uh, in chapter 2 here in verse 3, he says, Now by this we know that we love him, that is Christ, if, and here's, here's the evidence that you truly love God, that you truly love Jesus, if we keep his commandments. Now someone will say to us, well, but it's not of works. You are saved by grace alone. And at the same time, here we have a passage to say, listen, this is how you know that we love him if you keep his commandments. Now, this isn't saying here that the way that you're saved is by what you do. No, it is saying this is the evidence of your salvation because there's a change of nature and a change of heart. And now you give your life over and desiring to obey him in all things. Jesus said this one time to his disciples. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I tell you to do? So he's telling us here that this life of obedience is an indicator of your heart change and who governs and who masters your life. It says uh, that if uh, anyone who doesn't keep his commandment is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps the word, the love of God is perfected in him. And so you can see here, even as James tells us that faith without works is dead, that you and I are saved by faith and by grace, and yet at the same time, we live it out in an absolute desire and obedience to please God. And, and something is activated on the inside. The love of God is activated on the inside of us. Uh, and that truth is, uh, is manifested. Now he talks, and here's something about the love language that is talked about down in verse 9. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Now this is, uh, causes quite the conflict, doesn't it, in our life? Because our definition of hate is when sometimes we're prone to think, hey, I, I, that person just it aggravates me or that individual. I don't care so much about being around that person. Now I don't think that God's talking here uh, in the sense of uh, that, that you and I don't have those individuals that are, are abrasive in our life. He's talking about hatred here is an absolute rejection. Hatred here is, uh, if you had the power, you'd retaliate back. Hatred here is an unwillingness to release somebody. Uh, maybe somebody who's offended you. And the Bible says here that if you hate your brother, uh, you're in darkness. That, that the love of God is not overflowing in your heart. Verse 10, he who loves his brother abides in the light. And a brother, we talk about, you know, you and I are, are in this point. We hate sin, but, but there's this aspect of which God enables us to love with the love of Jesus. And, uh, and this, this is a mark in our life 
This is a, an, a, an affirmation of a character uh, alignment with God. And so it says, verse 11, he who hates his brothers in darkness uh, and um, walks in the darkness. And so we understand how important it is for us to uh, address any issues of our attitudes toward brothers or sisters of which we've been wounded or hurt or offended. And, and the Bible tells we love them, that we, we, we choose with the act of the will to love them. And, uh, and, and the, a powerful, this is the language of the Spirit. This is the, this is the move of, the God that, of God that's in our heart. Now, he gives us a, down in the Bible a command in which he's asking basically the question, which world do you belong to? You'll find this down in verse 15. Which world do you belong to? Because there's two different worlds that you can be a part of. Do not love the world or the things in the world. So we're talking about this fallen world. We're talking about this fallen state. Um, not talking about the enjoyment of the things that God has given us, okay? In fact, Jesus said, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. And so we're, we're speaking more here about the, the dark aspects of the world, that, that fallen state, that sinful state. He says, don't love that. In fact, he says, if anyone loves the world, love of the Father is not in him. Because the love of God that's, that's, that's activated on the inside of us, we're, we're heaven-minded. We, we despise the things that God despises. We hate the things that God hates. And so to embrace things, and we're talking about a culture that is corrupt and wicked and evil. Sure, we love the people that are caught in, this, in the stranglehold of that, but, but there is a contrast here which we, we're making a decision. This world is not my home. We're just passing through. And then he describes the three aspects that govern the affairs of this life. He says, all that's in the world. You see that in verse 16. And he names three, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he sums it all up in this. All of that is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And you'll find the battles of the flesh are always revert to this. And that is that we're struggling with our own lower nature in the flesh. Don't walk in the flesh, the Bible says. If you live by the flesh, you'll fulfill the lust of the flesh. But walk in the spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're dealing with the eye, lust of the eyes. What, what even Eve saw when she saw that the tree was good for food, she took of it. And, and, and everything in this world is activated by what we see. And so we got to be looking at the right things. And then he talks about the pride of life. That is that element where the man and woman decided they didn't need God and they could live independently from God and they could make their own decisions and choices. And that pride and get a hold of us, even as that which brought Lucifer down or that brought uh, the first man and woman down. And so we're reminded of some of verse 17, this world is passing away and the lust that is in it, all of that is coming is going to come to pass and it's it, but it's narrowed down to these three specific things then he talks about the spirit of antichrist in verse 18 you have heard that antichrist is coming and then he says it's even the antichrist spirit is here and the, and and that's the thing we have to understand before the actual antichrist antichrist spirit is anything against god anything that stands in opposition to the ways of god and the and, uh, and the authority of God, that's the spirit of Antichrist. And then he talks about this anointing. And I want to just emphasize this in verse uh, 20, says you have an anointing from the Holy One. In verse 26, the anointing which you've received from him abides in you. Uh, you don't need anybody to teach you anymore, in fact, because this anointing uh, teaches you concerning all things. I think we underestimate the availability of an anointing that comes from God by the Holy Spirit that can be activated, ought to be activated, ought to be stirred up in our life. And this powerful anointing, you can ignore it, but I'm saying if you'll pursue it, you and I will experience this freedom in the Spirit. That's why it concludes in this chapter, abide in Him. So that when he appears, that when Jesus reappears, we won't have to be ashamed, but we'll have confidence and we'll be ready and anxious to join him uh, at his coming. Friend, I just want you to know today what a joy it is to know that John says, hey, listen, I write these things that you do not sin, that we have a power available to us and that we can live victoriously obeying him in all things that we couldn't do in our own spirit by the power of God, that there's an anointing that's been given to us, that we don't have to be of this world, we can oppose the Antichrist spirit, and we can have an anointing that enables us to abide in Christ so that when he appears, we will be ready and will not be ashamed. I pray today, may you walk in the power of that good Holy Spirit and let that anointing flow through you.